Good evening, all, and welcome to Calberger's Corner for this week's What to Play on Wednesday. I am Lord Calberger Guiler, Canadian Meridian Cross, Canadian Argent Comet, Canadian Argent Lamp, Canadian the Falcon's Faith, and Reaper, coming to you live from the Baron of the Osprey on the southern coast of Meridiers. Uh, tonight, I'm joined by a new friend from Avacal, Arwen of Leicester. Good evening, Arwen, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Cal, and thank you for inviting me to your show. Uh, so I'm from Avacal. Um, but I also used to be from Eldemare, um, so that's why you see trilliums and you see griffins on my stuff. Uh, but, you know, I started there a long, long time ago, back in 1993, when I first enjoyed games. Ooh. Weekend, we're having we're having Yule, and we're, one of the things about Yule is in Avacal, it's one of the only events that doesn't have fighting or fencing. So it often has games. So, to, you know, we're going to try to do a games room. So. Uh, one of the games I've never caught on was Fox and Geese. So hoping that you can help me. And, and yes, that is that's two reasons why we're here, actually. So yeah, so let's talk about that for a second. So this weekend we've got the the Barony Borealis is doing the their Yule event, and I'm yeah. excited. So I have been trying to get games events happening, and I have now in the last month heard of two and the third coming, I think. And I'm like stoked because that's like I've been pushing for it, like trying. No, we can do games online, guys. Really. And we was like, no, we can't. It's dumb. And I was like, no, we really, we can. Uh, so yeah. I maybe I'm becoming infectious and I'm, I'm, I'm spreading my little gaming tendrils out. So, so yeah. So tell us a little about that. What all, do you, what all do you got going on? So we've got, um, so we've got a Zoom room channel set up that we're going to have 20 clock, 20 breakout rooms. So like, think about having 20 game, game tables that you can go and play a game. So you can show up. We can provide you a link. Um, you can take your friends. We figured out tech to be able to uh, know who's playing what game in what room. So you can go and heckle, gamble, you know, just hang out and see and and go and check it out. Or you can just have a quiet place to go and chat with your friends like you would do at a normal table at an event. So That's awesome. So I think that's what I was looking at. the uh, we, I, I was You showed me some of the tech you, you're using. So like I use Roll20 for all my stuff, and it works great. But... I saw what you guys were doing with the playingcards.io, which I had seen before, but hadn't really dug into a whole lot. Uh, I'm excited about that as a platform. I haven't had a chance to really use it as much since I like I wanted to for actually, I was going to update it for this show. Um, but it, I think it's going to be the future of some of my gaming stuff as well, because it's a much cleaner platform for board games. Whereas Roll20 is great for doing role-playing games. Uh, it is not the best for doing board games. It works and it, I've, I, I've made it function, but uh, playingcards.io, it has a lot more features in it. So. Um, what we thought was really neat was is that you can actually import a game board very easily with a graphic. And then what I like is the tactile movement of the of the pieces, right? So the pieces are fairly easy. Uh, I wouldn't want to try to play a D20 version game like, a you know, AD&D or something like that. That just isn't going to happen. But like, I mean, definitely most of our medieval games, definitely you know, something that you could work on. Um, the game, the card games are the same. You can import cards as well. So right. if you have a card deck of complete, you know, medieval t cards, it's a great way to uh, do that as a, as a platform. So. Awesome. So, yeah, so, uh, so I'll be there uh, teaching a couple of games. I'm going to be teaching actually Fox and Geese, which we're doing today and uh, Nyman's Morris as well. So uh, come out and hang out with me for a couple hours or the other, uh, instructors or just come out and hang out and play some games. I'm, it, I think it's going to be a lot of fun and we'll uh, hopefully breed some more gaming events. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so yeah, let's get into the topic of the night, Fox and Geese. Uh, this game is deceptively simple, which means it's hard. Uh, I, I, I love watching it play and I love playing it, but yeah, it is difficult. So uh, let's get into some of the rules. And for that... Uh, we're going to use the way, way back machine and toss it back to Pascal. Hey, uh, hey, Pascal, you want to help us with this game tonight? Hey, thanks, thanks again, future Pascal. Cal. So, Fox and Geese is a game that was played in the later medieval times, with the earliest record being from Edward IV between 1461 and 1483. Now, the records actually consisted of him buying two foxes and 26 geese for Merrill's which is probably referring to two, two games of fox and geese. Now, the game itself is played with two players, with one taking on the role of the fox and the other the flock of geese, or in the case of Calvary's Corner, a survivor and a bunch of zombies. The idea is the fox is trying to eliminate all of the geese, 
where the geese are trying to stay alive and block the fox in. The board consists of a cross-shaped diagram of 33 points, or a square of nine points in the center with, a, with rectangles of six points on each of its sides. In addition to the board, the play, players will need 13, 15, or 17 tokens of a single color to represent the geese, and a, a token of another color to represent the fox. And these tokens can be anything, uh, any shape, any sizes, rocks, simple, or complicated carved figurines. The game is set up with the 13 geese placed on the bottom three rows, one to each point. The player of the fox is allowed to take and place his token anywhere on the remaining points. There are modifications to allow for 15 or 17 geese. They would just add those geese on the next line up on either side. Uh, the more geese, the more balanced the game becomes uh, in favor of the geese. Uh, this game is very, very heavily favored to the fox's side. The geese player always takes the first turn, moving any of his tokens to an empty adjacent point along any of the lines. The fox then takes his turn doing the same. Play alternates between the two players. The fox may, instead of moving, kill or capture an adjacent goose by jumping over it to an empty adjacent point along any of the lines, as long as there is a marked line. That goose is then removed from the board. After the fox jumps one goose, he may continue to do so if he is now able to capture another goose along another line. This can continue on a single turn, allowing multiple jumps or multiple captures um, in a single movement. The game continues until the fox cannot make a move, in which case the geese win, or the geese are whittled down to a number less than four. Um, with four being the minimum to capture the fox. Any questions? Future Cal can help you out. Back to you guys. Thanks, Pascal. Sorry, I. You know what? I love my shtick. So, uh, so this game is simple and frustrating all at the same time. Uh, I'm going to pull. Go ahead and pull this tab up uh, for the ease of use tonight. We are actually going to play with the full 17 geese. Uh, I feel like that is, in my opinion, provides the most balanced gameplay. Um, past that, anything less than that is a, uh, it's just not fair, frankly. I don't know how anybody wins. I'm sure that's possible, but it is it is difficult for me. Um, so, Arwen, do you have any questions about the actual rules? I think the rules are simple enough, but is there anything I didn't cover? I I think the rules are simple. So the geese, the geese can't jump. Correct. But the fox can move or jump. Correct. Yeah, yeah and you can move or jump, and always, always one space at a time um, for both players. Um, and like I said, the, the the biggest thing for the biggest thing that's the hard part for me is the figuring out how to get the geese to actually box the fox in. So I showed an example, and I'll and I'll, I'll show it again here because um, I think this is like I was I had to sit down and do the math of how what's the minimum number to capture the fox. So if you have four geese left and they are in this arrangement. It keeps the fox from moving. Now, technically, you could do like also like if you had six, this becomes a block as well. That to me, in, in my opinion, that is also a uh, a stopped movement. Even though he still has movable options, he is restricted to just those two squares or those three squares. And I think that is enough of a, a blockade. Uh, any so, and that could be any of the squares uh, or any of the the areas. Um, I think that is sufficient of a block, in my opinion. I have never been able to get there uh, with the geese playing with it with anybody who's decent at this game. So we'll uh, honestly, and this is me speaking from a bit of a uh, of hope tonight. Uh, as long term watchers of this channel, and for those of you who are new, I never win. I never get to win games on this channel. I'm hoping tonight that I might actually pull one out. So maybe. Uh, all right. <laughs> So, uh, so we're, we're, we'll probably play two rounds, uh, one with uh, each of us as the fox, so we can sort of see the balance. Um, and if we have time, we may pull a third to determine a, a real winner for the night, depending if, if we uh, if one of us does not take both games. Uh, so would you like okay. to start as the fox or as the geese? I'll let you pick. I'll start as the geese, because that's always eluded me. There you go. All right. Well, then uh, you actually get the first move, so I will let you take that, and we'll see how this game goes. Hmm. Uh, and for those of you watching, I, I put it in the channel. If you have any questions or you see a thing we miss, maybe miss or you feel like we cheated, uh, by we I mean me, uh, please let us know. And I'll, we will either attempt to correct that or we'll explain what we did. 
Um, cause I have, I have often messed up things and not realized I did it. So, so I moved to the square beside the, uh, yeah, right there. All right. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to be a little aggressive here and come after you. I'm going to go there and get in your way and see if I can uh, maybe get me a goose. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. And I tried to block you. Yeah. All right. I feel like going in this corner is probably not the best idea. We'll see what happens here. And then I blocked you again. So one of the things that I think, uh, so the, the goose have to be really systematic with this. Um, yeah. So the fox can be very cavalier because because there's no way for him to be captured you know, on a single turn, like it, it's very much an obvious, like it has to be a progressive time thing. Um, the fox can just sort of dance around a lot. And like with this, you had a choice of losing one or the other, and I'll pick that one and move it off the board. Um, and that happens a lot of times where the, where the fox will end up getting in a corner like that, and, and you basically just have to take a loss somewhere. Um, but that also means you could use the geese to bait the fox into a hole. Um, they might then allow you to do something with it. So do you actually have to jump the second one? Oh, oh I don't have to, but I will. I'm sorry. I actually didn't see it. I wasn't, I wasn't looking. I, I, so it's not that you have to. Correct. Yeah. So this is not, there is not a forced movement in this. It's not a forced movement. Okay. Uh, there is nothing. Okay. I'll say this. There's nothing I've read that there ever is forced movement, but I also don't think of a reason why you wouldn't want to. Um, because of the size of the board, I can't see a reason where it would put you in a bad position. Uh, because when you jump, you also remove a piece. So you're, you are, you always have a hole to get out at that point. Um, I don't know. I, I'd like to see maybe and that's a sort of a math problem. Of, is there a spot where you could force a jump that then puts me into a hole I can't get out of? That actually be kind of a cool thing to figure out. There probably is. Now, I, I mean, there may be. Uh, it's like it took me a minute to find the exact how to do it with four pieces because I, I read that you could do it with four pieces or to block them in four pieces, but it took me a minute to find the exact of that. So I'm not the uh, the best on that one. So it is a, it is your move, I believe. And I move from here to here. Gotcha. All right. Sometimes it's hard to tell um, what's moved. That's what the one thing about this that I like hate using these games that are not that it doesn't sort of keep track of that for you. It's always hard to keep track of what's uh what has been moved. All right, I'm going to get out of this corner and slide over there. When I was uh, when I was setting this up, and I was like, "All right, I had found a I had found a fox, I had found a geese, and I was like, eh, it looks kind of dopey, eh, whatever." I was like, "All right, what else can I find? Ooh, zombies. That sounds zombies. Cool. Zombies yeah. are good. Makes it a little more interesting." All right, we'll keep sliding over here. Like the other, uh, in my, the, the other difficult thing about this game is the actual grid lines. So because it's always uh, it's gridded to the center points on those, and this, the extra points don't have you know, all the diagonals to them, it actually becomes a little more difficult when you're looking at trying to find the angles. So with like chess and checkers, you have it's a just a generic grid. You can go any direction, and it's easy. Um, with this, and there's a couple of the games that use these very boards like this, it is a little more difficult to find all of your spots uh, because there's not the connections don't go everywhere. Um, which I think probably is the only saving grace for the geese in this, honestly, is that they've got a little bit of restriction. Yeah. Well, and they also have a little more play, too. They don't right. have just diagonal movements. So. Um, you know what? I'm actually going to go back. I'm going to run away a little bit, see what you do. Move from here to here. There you go. I see you back there. And that is, so So and you're, you're doing what I what I think is the honestly the best strategy that I've found, and we, we talked about it ahead of time, is keeping your geese in a big block together and just moving slow. Um, like, you, it's really easy to want to play aggressive with this, and like, I've tried it. I've tried to go up with a couple of ways to do it, but it is... Um, it doesn't ever seem to play out as well as you think it should. Because um, you figure with 17 pieces, this should be an easy game uh, for the geese, but it is just not. Uh, 
No, it's not. So, so there's a 15, 17, 15, and 13 version? Correct. Yeah. So that's the, the, the thir 13 is the most common, I think, that you see in, in, not in period. Um, but in, uh, in things I've read is, is you'll see people adding 15 or adding two more or four more, um, because it makes it more balanced. Um, so I, I you know, so what I'm saying is, is as for two new players, 17 and against one is a, is a more fair game. Um, and I'll take that goose. Thank you very much for that zombie. Um, so, so as you get good, then you take it down to 15 or take it down to 13. Um, as the, you know, I, and I've never, I guess I, I've never, I've never won a game of this as the geese. So I don't consider myself a good player of this. I am much better as the fox because it's just an easier game. Um, but yeah, the, but the actual, yeah, the period, the excellent examples you see documented is always 13 player or 13 pieces. Um, So where do we see the act? Where do we see the period examples? Uh, so Bell references a couple in his book. I have to pull that out. Uh, I've got it in my handout, which I'll post in the description after the stream. Um, but so as uh, as Pascal mentioned, Edward the Fourth uh, talks about it. He apparently was a common game in his court, um, and did, uh, did I think the funniest record was they were talking about talking about he, where he ordered. Uh, Two, two foxes and, and 26, uh, yeah, 26 geese um, that would be the pieces for the game, but he was ordering actual foxing geese, which I think is just sort of a funny reference there. So it's one of things like when you're reading ledger books, it's hard to know what he was actually ordering. Were they actual foxing geese or were they playing pieces? Uh, and without knowing the, uh, the going rate for either of those at the time, it would be difficult to, uh, to suppose. So I went. Yep, okay. I was catching up. Sorry. So I have a bad habit, uh, and if, if you watch me, knows this is that when I flip back to the Streamyard screen, I will uh, often try to move things on the Streamyard screen and realize I cannot do that. So I have to make sure I toggle back and forth because they look the exact same to me because they're about the same size. So I move to here. Uh, yep. Chase you back down here. So I've got to find. Uh, so so the way you're playing with everything staying together, I've got to sort of find the outliers. I've got to stay around the edges and uh catch one alone that seems to be the uh, which which i honestly is a common fox hunting practice is uh you know catch the catch the weak one on the edge there Ooh, All right i have a choice now which direction do i go let's see they are equal i will go to the right and take that one i'm i am favoring the female lobbies it seems and All right, let's see. Pop back to here so I can get that guy in the middle. See if he's going to get blocked behind. Also, I see uh, Tisa in the comments. She's out there rooting against me as always. <laughs> and I appreciate her for that. She's I, I I am trying to root for myself, but it's it's. This is one of a series of games where we talk about it being unequaled sides, right? right? Yeah, Asymm an asymmetric game, correct? Asymmetric game, so. So the, and this one, so Toffle is another good example of an asymmetric game. I think this one, I, I, okay, actually, I'll, I'll, let me take the back. Toffle has the same problem. Um, so, so defending on Toffle is, in my, in my opinion, easier than attacking with Toffle. So in this case, uh, attacking is, is easier than defending. So it's sort of the exact opposite. But so in Toffle, your, your, your goal of defense is to get the king out. You have a singular focus, and that's it. Um, and so with this, with the fox, you have a singular focus of just kill geese. And with, you know, 13, 15, or even or 17 geese, you have, you have a, a lot of options to do that. Um, and there's literally nothing restricting your movement. There's nothing saying you can't do X, Y, or Z. Um, I'll take another goose there and take another goose there. Um, and it's just, it is so easy for the goose player to make a mistake. Uh, that's all it takes is one little mistake um, to do that. Oh, we have a question for you, directed to uh, to you, uh, Dave Arwen. So, yeah. Rose asks, you fought in many castle battles. Uh, do you feel like there's any connection between the strategy for this game and the strategies of actual war? Uh, actually, I do. It's partially uh, so. A castle battle is an example 
at Penzik, um, the outside when we're when we're attacking the castle, we have unlimited resurrections, whereas the people inside the castle do not. So, uh, so in the in the example, uh, you know, the fox has the ability to basically take everything versus trying to survive. So I would say that that's pretty close. So. That's true. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Because yeah, essentially, you know, with the fox not being able to be killed, he has unlimited resurrection. I can see the, uh, the illusion there. Uh, and I have moved, so it is your move. There we go. Ooh, going back into your box there. Let's see. Let me move down there. Yeah, I, I, that's actually that's a really good question. Thank, thank you for that, Runa. Uh, she's always she always helps out with some good questions. Um, that's always an interesting thing. Like I, when I look at other games, I always try to find the what strategies really play into this, or how do they really uh, connect to you know real life scenarios. And that, that's a good one. I like that. Uh, let's see. Let's see a question from Brian. So Brian asked, uh, "Do you know when they started adding a second fox? Most modern versions I've seen have two foxes." And Brian, I do not actually. Uh, you're correct though. Most modern versions do have two foxes, um, which to me is just ludicrous. I don't know how you would do this with two foxes versus just one. Um, and, and maybe I should try that at some point. Maybe it makes it harder. I don't see how it make it harder for the fox to have another fox though. Um, unless it's just... Hmm, actually, I thought about that. If it's two foxes and you only have to capture one of them to win... That may actually be easier for the geese because you have to then because the fox only move one at a time, so you're having to sort of divide your uh, divide your focus. That may make it easier. I never I never considered that. So, well, I would suspect that the f the fox the two foxes. It depends if 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 you have to if you have to capture both foxes, right? It would be more difficult. Right? Correct. So. But if it's just capturing one fox, so I think that, that would be rule. I don't maybe maybe look that up. And actually, Brian, if you don't mind, if you have that rule available, see if you can see whether it's a capture both or just capture one in the modern versions, because that might be a way to make it uh, more balanced. All right, we'll pop up here in the corner. Um. I think another house rule you can make with this is that the fox can't repeat the same movement uh, more than you know in a row. Because like so like that, when I moved from um, here to here, I now couldn't go back to that square. I'd have to go to here. Um, I think limiting the fox more might make it a little more difficult for the fox because um, now I've got to go sort of around that corner um, to get out of that corner. Uh, versus going directly back across, which now is going to make me potentially be blocked in. So now I can't go back into that corner. Um, you know, I got to go down here. Um, yeah. So that so that that may be another uh, sort of house rule that may make the game a slightly more balanced. Well, that's sort of like um, the back and forth that you can have for nine man, right? So very similar to that. So. Right. Which, which you, yeah, so you can do that nine minutes more. So you can, you know, so I, that's that's one of the best strategies for that. I, that I, you know, I'll, I'll teach this on Saturday is that uh, you can set up two mills in two that are parallel and bounce one stone between them. You've won the game. Um, there's a there's a way to do that unique setup that makes it very simple. Um, that if the other player sees you doing it, they're going to immediately block you and stop you from doing that. But if you can be sneaky enough, you can make it happen. It, it it helps when the other person's new. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true. Most games are easier than the other players do. Um, all right. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try that restriction. See if I can restrict myself a little bit because that's I think that's a makes this game a little more challenging. So all right, go ahead. Because I've already seen where I, I want to go backwards on a move, but I can't. Um, that is that has now made it more difficult for me. So. All right, so Brian says in the modern games, it is capture both. Okay, so that's interesting. However, if a fox misses capturing a goose, it is ejected from the, from the board. It can only turn if the other fox catches a goose. If both are ejected, fox team loses. Oh, interesting. Okay. The fox misses capturing a goose. Like if the player... Uh, so so it fails, fails to jump. So. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. That is a, a whole different variation. I like that. 
So I went to here. Yep, I see you. All right, we're going to change directions. So you, I, you are, so I, I do feel like my movement is being limited now. You actually, you are, you are affecting me. I will let you know that. Um, oh, okay. Although I'm about to uh, make some headway, I think, and clear out that hole. This is one of those classic spots. Now you have a choice. You're, you're going to lose one or the other. It's a, can you save one? Um, or you're going to leak or clear a hole for me, I guess would be the other option. I'm going to let you clear a hole. Mm -hmm. So you did have an option. I will point it out to you now that you've made your move. Uh, you could have moved this guy in the, here down into the bottom corner, um, and that would have uh, saved one. But I will now take that one. Yes. Clear out that one. Move her over there. But uh, forcing me into that corner is not, not a terrible plan. So we'll move up. Uh, and thank you for for looking that up, Brian. I appreciate the uh, little bit of knowledge here. Here to there. That's it. All right. Well, my only option would be to move up. Looks like. Let's see. All right, so in this case, if we were playing with I can't move backwards, I'm actually stuck now. Um, mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So go ahead and move me backwards to see, because I, I think you may, you may actually have me uh, fairly well trapped, actually, because of that. Uh, yep, I'm done. You're done. Yep, because I can do that. You've got to move the top guy over. Yeah. I think it would be the best move. Yeah, or the bottom one, either one. Either one works. Yeah. Well, either one. This one, too, right? Yeah, actually, actually, if you move him, that's better because then if I, I have to move back up. And I don't know. Mm, it's going to be tight. Can you keep me held? Let's see. Yep, that's it. No, I'm stuck. You can now you can now move your back pieces all day long, and I can't go anywhere. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so, even with a game that you're supposed to be bad at, that you don't even understand how to play, I still lose. All right. But you, uh, you usually lose. Right. So, but I, I, so I, I noticed that. So, about halfway in, I, I sort of self imposed the rule of I can't move backwards. Mm -hmm. And that changed the game dramatically. I got, yeah. I felt the shift on that. It, it was, it was only a couple times where it really mattered, I think. There was, there was when I was moving backwards um, from right to left, I felt, I was like, man, I wish I could go back one and then because I could have took a piece. Um, but that, that made that difference a little bit. Um, couldn't I have jumped over the center one diagonally? I don't know, Kiesel. Let me look. Um, okay, so Kisa, if by center one you mean this one, the answer is no. So there's no line there. Um, oh, like this way. Oh, I, I was here. I so I, I could yes. Yeah, so you that could I have jumped here. Uh, but yeah. I think I think we had a piece there when when I moved. So, um, but yeah, I mean that's. So yeah, so if I do that, you can move that piece down. And then I'm, you know, I go to there, and you move like basically it's it's gonna be a it's a stale it's, it's gonna be a, a matter of time. It's stale, right? box, yeah. the, box me in. Um, but yes, Keith, I could have done that on a move, um, but she had pieces of there to defend it. So, all right, give me a moment. We are 30 minutes in, so we have time to play another one. So let me uh, reset the board real quick. Um, are we, are we, do you have any uh, so you have any fun war stories or gaming stories you want to tell us while I reset the board? Well, uh, interesting gaming stories. Mm -hmm. So 
last year at Yule. So Yule tends to be this place where apparently Avakel decides to give me a peerage. So two <laughs> times they gave me a peerage uh, for Pelican. And then last year they put me on vigil for Laurel. And it, they were both at, I wanted to do it at my local event, which is vigil, which happens to be, you know, and it also gave me time for friends from Eldemir and from, from Ontier and everyone to fly in. So last year I sat there and I said, I need to do a vigil, but someone else was being elevated to the order, um, order of defense. Mm -hmm. so I wanted him to have, it was his first peerage. So I wanted him to have that. So I basically said, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a games table and that's where I'm going to sit my vigil. So I actually had a bunch of games of block house, um, goose, a couple of simple games that people came and basically you could come by, you could learn, learn a game. And then as a result, you got two little dice of a, of a color choice, um, some paper, and you could go off and play whatever game, you know, two versions of Glock House and Goose on one side and it allowed people to, you know, learn a new game. I probably taught about 10 people that day and, you know, it was kind of a neat way to sit a vigil rather than, you know, I had a friend from Eldemir, um, Eric, he, he did the same thing for his Pelican right. um, and, and play games all day. So, you know, it's awesome. a neat way to, you know, spend a day, you know, uh, when you're sitting and contemplating, uh, but it was a great way to get other people involved, right? So that I could still be social, but 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 have a way to sort of chat with an individual by playing one or two individual games, right? So right. No, that, that, that's that's really an idea, especially for a second period, because like I, I'm not a peer, I've never sat vigil. I, I've now been to one vigil um, as a as a person showing up. The, actually, this past weekend, um, one of our friends from Southbound's got elevated. And she had an open vigil and anybody could go into it. It was a Zoom room. So I was like, I'm going to go, you know, like, I, I was like, I don't know. I don't want to go. I, I, I know her and like, she's a friend of mine. But like, I don't really know what to tell a peer. I don't you know what, what knowledge can I give? And so my peer was like, no, maybe go ask her something. Or, or uh, one of the other peers in the room was like, maybe go ask her a question. She's been hearing stuff all day. Maybe go ask her something. I was like, well, that's a really good idea, actually. I'm going to go. So I went in there and talked to her, and we had a nice little chat for a few minutes, and it was pleasant. But I could see how the second period, the second vigil, would be less fulfilling, maybe, because you've already heard all the how to be a better peer words, right? And whereas, yeah, Laurel is different than Pelican, Knight's different than Laurel. There's different advice for those two things, but the actual peerage part is sort of the same, at least from my experience with it. Um, yeah. So yeah, varying that up to do something like that is a really neat idea. Um, so you're not just sitting in a tent all day again doing the the silent contemplation, which which is a great thing. And I like I look forward to the day I get to do that. And it was a really cool thing. But like, uh, yeah, I gaming tavern is like a way better way to do that. So. And and part of it was is that I didn't need a tent. I didn't need any space. I just needed a table in the middle of the hall, and people just came by and chatted and and that. And what was good was is you know I had a uh, a young man who was, you know, the nephew of the of the event steward come by and say, he'd like to learn some games. And I said, sure. You know, so then all of a sudden, you know, I had like five kids who all wanted to learn how to play. And, you know, we learned a couple of easy games. So, so. That's awesome. it, it, it makes it makes you more approachable as a peer and also it makes games more approachable. So that's that's yeah. good all around. Yeah. So that was kind of a win win for everybody. So. Okay. All right. Let's dive back into this and see if I can lose again. All right, so I guess I'm playing the fox this time. Uh, you actually, are, or, sorry, I'm playing the geese this time. You're welcome to put the fox wherever you'd like. Um, so, um, okay, so the so the fox doesn't have to start here. It does not. It, according to the rules I've read, and most so the boards are all labeled. You'll usually see a spot in the middle where the, where it shows to start it. But the actual rules, if you read them, says the fox can start anywhere. Oh, okay. I haven't found a good reason for him to start anywhere. Like I, I usually start him about in that midpoint because then you're sort of can play aggressive early on. Um, because if you start him like in the back corner or something, then you end up having two or three turns where you can't do anything. Um, but yeah, so you're welcome to move that wherever you'd like. I can start him there. You can All start. Right. Sure, you can move. Cool. All right. Let's see here. I'm gonna do that. All right. And we'll do that. So, yeah, so my goal is definitely to keep as many foxes together as I, or many of my geese together as I can. Um, 
Because that seems to be the only way to to logically do this. Make you just dance around me. So are we playing that I can't go back to the square I was in? I, I will let you do if if you want to self impose that I will I will let you uh, unless unless you have no other option uh, you can do that if you want to uh, I, I definitely I will I will tell you it definitely makes it much harder um, yeah all right let's see uh, probably a little more balanced too even right. though... uh, let's see uh, and honestly doing that may make it you know doing the the one goose and thirteen or one fox and thirteen geese with that rule. That may become balance, and like so, that that'll be a. Now that I've thought of that, I may end up going back and replaying some games and seeing if I can uh, find that balance point again. It's honestly, it's hard as the goose too to to like. I, it's like I don't want to move. You know, it's like a lot of times you're like, I'm like, oh, it's fine. I'll just sit here. Like, you know, I don't really want to move. He, but he has to move, right? He has to move or jump, right? Yeah, like yeah, both, both players have to move each turn. That's that's the thing. Um, so it's actually a lot of times it's almost you're you're having to you're having to do something on both sides, um, or you kind of like I mean, realistically, you can just sit here and stare at each other, right? But it, it doesn't accomplish the goal. Um, but it's really difficult to like find the spot for the goose to the geese to move out of where it's not dangerous, where there's not some risk. Um, Do I move from here to there? Let's see. Mm. Mm. I see we had, we had uh, one of your students is watching as well. I don't know if you saw that in the comments. Uh, Diana Africana from Avicom, she's out there watching. Yes. Oh, so, of course. <laughs> appreciate appreciate your, the the Abacal folks tuning in this evening. She's an awesome yeah. weaver. She's an oh, awesome cool. weaver, and a great and a great design uh, digital design herald. So, oh, uh, that's that in, in today's heraldry days, that that is a a much needed talent. Yes. There's something my my I've I've done some of it. I can I can make my way around. My wife does that a lot better than I do. So it, whenever I do device stuff, I'll do all the uh, sort of research and do the conflict checking and all the the the, the, the heavy lifting. And then I say, hey, see, but can you actually make this pretty for me? And she does all the the actual paperwork paperwork. She's just way faster at it than I am. Rather, I think she has more patience for it than I do. Um, although I'm getting better, so. Uh, well, here we go. We got Runa. Runa has asked us another question. Uh, in this year of the plague, uh, what is the most fun you've had in an online revel or social um, other than Yule this weekend, which is going to be a blowout? Myself? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We, we, we can uh, both. I, I think the most interesting is being able to, like, seeing a bunch of people that I only see at Penzik when I get a chance to fly there or drive 36 hours from right. it. Um, so I get to see a whole bunch of people that I don't normally see. And one of my best friends who loves to, who sings songs, which is, um, we call him Uncle Justinian. Um, and he lives in Eldemir. And I used to camp with him at Penzik mm -hmm. for many, oh. many, many years. And it's really nice because I got a chance to see him, even though I don't normally see him, except for when I go to Pendlex. So that's right. the whole thing for me. Hey. Uh, it's, it's your move as well. Um, I think for me, uh, uh, yeah, so it, that, that's a great point. The, the thing I've enjoyed most about, and it's not, not really a question, the thing I've enjoyed most about the, the plague times is just seeing people that I like meeting people. So, like, for instance, Hi, I met somebody from Avacal that I never would have met in a thousand years. Of, in, in, you know, I'm sure we may have run into each other at some point, but the uh, chances of that were much less likely. But you know, getting to go to events in, I think one weekend I went to an event in Locock, Artemisia, in the West, all in the same day or something. It was like a, it was a whirlwind day of of eventing. Um, it's been a lot, uh, been, a, been a lot of fun. But as far as actual revels and things, ah, uh, so. South Downs, uh, the very here in Atlanta, or been in Atlanta. South, South Downs is my second home. Uh, I, I I live in Osprey, but I claim South Downs. Uh, they they throw a pretty good party, I will say. 
Um, a lot of the Rebels that Meridiase has had have been sponsored by uh, uh, Senora Destina, who is from Southbound. Uh, and she is sort of our, the, the unofficial Rebel coordinator for Meridiase and does an, a stellar job with it. Uh, so yeah, just getting to hang out and have fun with people. Um, the uh, Southbound specifically had their monthly party that we had at Castle Wars last weekend. And I, I haven't gotten fussed at about it yet, but yes, also I'm the onesie champion. So, you know, so that back out there. Um, Fikin, Fikin is clearly not watching because he didn't fuss at me tonight. I guess I do remember one, which is I went to an uh, Eldamarian court, and then at the end of court, they decided that they, because it was supposed to be crown tournament, so they decided that they would do a rock, paper, scissors um, competition oh. uh, tournament, which apparently I won. So. Oh, so, so you're like the you know virtual king of, of Eldamir. Is that what I, that what I hear? Yeah, well, <laughs> the kingdom of Eldamir. So, so apparently my queen decided that maybe she now owns Eldamir. I, they I, that's that that's sound logic, frankly. I think it's, it's, so. So yes, Abacol is now uh, is annexed Eldamir. I think that is that's that's perfectly sound. Perfectly sound. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a couple things like that. People trying to do virtual tournaments. So uh, we did uh, Southbound's at a, uh, a video tournament this past weekend as well in Castle Wars, where everybody submitted videos of their of their pell work, and, and then it was judged, and and that went really well. Actually, it was a a lot of fun. Uh, I still can. So am I blocked if I can't go back? Um, so no, I say for this, uh, you can keep moving because you still have movement. Um, since that is a an extra rule, I think if if you have other movement, you have to take it. But if, if you can't, then you can go backwards. I think that that's what we did towards the end there. Um, but it does signal the end of times for you. Yeah. At least, at least it's probably not for you because you can still get out, but. Uh, was a, where I felt like I was trapped there. Let's see. No, we're going to move one guy up. But yeah, so, so they, did, they did that. Uh, what other virtual tournaments have I seen? Uh, I saw one that was a... Um, it was like Simon Says. Is they were doing, I, haven't, I haven't actually seen it play, but I saw the description of it. Uh, basically, it was a Pell. So there's a six-point drill in a Pell. And the idea was you grab your sword and you and you um, the the moderator would, would call a number or whatever or draw a card and you have to hit that point and then they draw another one you have to hit that one and then and then the next one and so you keep going until until you basically are out um, and then whoever was last standing you know got a point and you kept doing that sort of round after round and that one seemed really cool um, I also saw one that was. It was a card based one that I don't, I don't entirely didn't entirely understand, but it was like a you picked a, a spot to attack, and your opponent picked or you, you picked an attack and defense point like spot, and your opponent did the same, and then you sort of compared to see uh, you know who got a point or whatever, and it was like first of three points won the won the bout. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some interesting ways to do virtual tournaments that I would I would love to see people do more of. Um, Oh, I mean, heck, we could do the next crown list as a chess tournament. That would be the greatest thing. Let's just do, you know, make, make it a nine-month Morris or a chess tournament. And I think Call that it would, a day, yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be a great way to shoot King. I think, you know. Well, we're doing uh, SEA Jeopardy on Friday night. Um, the Sergeants of Avacal. So um, Avacal, which was birthed out of Ontier, has a program called Sergeantry. And those will actually have to um, learn two games um, and be able to teach one. So that's one of the requirements. And so they they will be sponsoring, and it has uh, some Avocal history, some SCA history, um, and, you know, it's, it's intended to very much try to um, get people involved. Um, and from seven till seven till nine, the Surgeons of Avacal will be doing um, Jeopardy, which I actually have even the sound tags for it, you know. Like, oh, nice. You know, Final Je this is Final Jeopardy, you know, including the song, so. That's awesome. So, yeah, that's, that, that's a really good point. I'm actually talking to, uh, what's that? well, to promote one of the shows I got coming up here. Um, so Duke Sean from um, Artemisia does, uh, he has the SCA Coach's Corner, and he does a lot about fighting. And he and I were talking uh, during the Cropo the other day, and he talked about things that, you know, they talk about knight, the knights do that are not fighting. And that there's so much more to being a knight than just fighting. Um, 
you know, one of the actual requirements for being a knight is learning to play chess, is knowing how to play chess. It's an incorporeal mm -hmm. thing. Um, but it's, you know, everybody always focuses on the fighting prowess and all that. But yeah, there's there's a lot more to, uh, to, to doing that. And I think, yeah, so games is one of those things I think we could get more, a little more steam out of it would be nice. So when on tier, when Avacal was, um, when Avacal and on tier um, had a very wide kingdom, you know, very large at the beginning, they just developed this thing called surgentry where mm -hmm. Basically, when the knights came up to an area, the only thing they needed to verify was the prowess of someone if they were a sergeant. So right. they have to know two games, they have to do bardic, they have to understand heraldry, they have to be able to do, you know, teach two games, no, uh, no medieval strategy, SCA history, and everything else, right? So, You know, so first goose. First goose. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that, 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 I, I would like to see something like that in uh, in Meridies. I, I like things that are so we have we don't have anything in Meridies that is that is sort of checklist based. Like there's like here's a list of things you have to do. Like everything we have is like all of our awards are just sort of generic excellence in you know blah thing. Um, I like having things like that that are sort of programs to guide people into a thing. Whatever that thing, so, is, an art thing or a fighting thing or whatever. So it's not just for sergeantry. We've now mm -hmm. expanded it. So yeomen are our combat archers. Uh, our wardens are our target archers. Uh, our courtiers are our service and arts and science people. Um, our gallants are the people who do rapier. Mm -hmm. uh, and every single one um, has the has the ability. To, to become a member of the sergeant tree. And so, right. and they swear fealty to the, one of the baronesses. So one of the three baronesses. Um, so you're in, you're in fealty with, with that. And we've had several peers take it as a way to establish their SCA-ism, if that makes any sense. Like how well do I know SCA, you know? Right yay history or avocal history uh, or medieval, you know, medieval tactics and things like that. So, um, so a lot of people found it really interesting to be able to establish that, you know, and it's, it's an interesting program. Um, it was birthed out of, of on tier um, mm -hmm. and avocal restarted it about, five, yeah, about seven years ago and, um, and all of these trials, they do a series of trials, are over a weekend. So they have to do a heraldry test. They have to teach their games. They have to teach their ga their, their everything. They have to be able to, you know, do court heraldry. And then they have to be reasonably competent on the field for their for their for their particular aspect. You know, so if they're an arts and science person, they need to be reasonably good as a as an arts and science person right so or if they're a rapier they have to be you know they have to have their own kit they have to have to do things and it includes things like persona development as well so it's a list of 12 items on it and it's it's quite the list of um criteria um and it's on the website on the link um so if you go to the sergeant tree uh social on friday um, information on the website, you can get you get the link to the Avacal uh, program itself. So yeah, I'll, I'll look it up. That, that's a that's a neat idea. I I I just like I like I'm a fan of checkboxes. I'm a fan of lists of you know do X Y Z things. Um, mm -hmm. It's just I, I enjoy sort of guided things, especially when I'm coming into new something new. Um, I think that's a great way to, to really uh, get integrated into a system, especially for so, so newcomers. That gives them a way to like. A thing to focus, you know. Oh, how do I get involved in the SCA? Well, I'll just do whatever. Oh, that, that's a great. That's that's a correct mentality, but it doesn't help people really get exposed to things. That seems like a way, great way to, you know, sort of guide somebody into that. It's neat. So our sergeants tend to be people that the Baron and Baroness will will send new people to. So because they know a little bit about everything, um, obviously they're focused in their particular focus. So if they're a rapier. They're, they're a gallant. Um, if they're a heavy fighter, then they would be a sergeant. But they know enough about everything to say, I know a little bit 
about this, but if you're really interested in games, you need to talk to Arwen or you need to talk to Philippe and, and, you know, they can help you out or, but they have a basic widespread understanding of the SEA. And, you know, part of it is the, their ability to be able to serve the Baroness. Right. So, right. Yeah. That's, that's so, okay. So, so did that start from the king level, or did it start from the baronial level and then grow? Like, where, where did that start? Which reckon? So, I do believe that it started from uh, a barony in the in Ontier, and it was simply due to the fact that it was remotely located from from on from what we call Ontier Core, right. uh, and then it moved into uh, moved into um, being supported by Avacal. Um, it took a hiatus for a little while, and then it got restarted, um, probably around 2014. Um, and and it's been a, pr a part of the program as we, we were in as when we were a principality, and then when when we went kingdom, we continued continued the program. So. I have to uh, talk to a certain Baroness of Southdowns and see if I can pitch the program to her and see if she wants to take that up. I think I think she was she would love that, and her and Wistrick would probably pick that up in a heartbeat. So yeah. All right, I, I, th I think I'm narrowing you down. I think I think I've got you are narrowing me down, but you know, <laughs> it's okay. I think it is your movement. Uh, so you and I move from here to here. Okay. I wasn't sure if I might have missed one there. So all right, okay. there we go. And then I have to move here. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 what's going to do you in right there is that force movement because I can do that, and that's going to put you in a pole. Yeah. Yep. That's it. That's it. All right. So yeah. So so I think those two things right there, um, having that force movement where you can't go backwards makes a big difference, and having seventeen geese makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, there you go. Well. So we, we tied it one for one. I think we're going to call it that. So I at least can walk away with some of my dignity this evening. Or at least one more. Dang it. Um, well, we, we definitely look forward to you reteaching the class on the weekend. So, so yeah. So, yeah. So those of you out there watching, uh, if you want to come play Fox and Geese with us, please do that. Uh, I will make sure. Actually, give me a second. I will put the event link into the description or into the comments. If I can find it. Or if you can find it, Patrick, right, if you have it available. Um, uh, I will, I'll share it out on Cowboy's Corner. So uh, follow this page, and I'll make sure I'll share that link out when we're done here. Um, so, uh, so are, are you less scared of fox and geese now? I guess that that was my goal tonight was to make you less. Scared I am. I am less scared of fox and geese. At least I understand that I am not the only one who struggles with right. strategy of it. Um, but my only other question is: is there's a bunch of other ones that are very similar, um, but aren't fox and geese, right? Uh, what do you mean by similar? Tafla, so, you mean the the Tafla the Tafla games are very oh, awful. So, uh, oh, so you mean asymmetric? Yes. Yeah. So there are other asymmetric games. So okay. Nefetaf is one, uh, and I did that a couple weeks ago with with Sammy. Uh, so it, it is a the, what they call Viking chess. Uh, mm -hmm. it, instead of being one on thirteen, it's it's uh it's twelve on twenty four. It's a, it's it's usually a half sides. Uh, okay. That it, it, always with asymmetric games, there's always two different wind conditions. So in this case was, you know, you had eating all the fox or getting out. Toffle is the same, or Toffle is the same way, is getting you to get the king out of out of check, essentially out of the middle, um, or whittle them down to less than, than not enough people. Um, okay. So, so it's, yeah, it's always a weird thing, uh, or try to capture the king. So it's, it's a, asymmetric games are weird, because you have to play, you always have to play them twice. I think. You can't just play one, because the, whereas you may be really good at playing the fox, but you're crap at playing geese or the other way around. Like I can be really good at playing Fox, but not good at playing geese because there are two very different wins or different right. play. Um, See, so yeah, there's a couple others. So obviously Pop has a couple of different variants that are the same idea with just different variations of the board size and shape. Um, Tableau is another one that's a, just a variation of Topple. Um, I think that's one that's on your list for this weekend as well as the, the Tableau. That's just essentially, it's a smaller version of Topple. Um, it's, I think it uses, 12 and 6 instead of instead of 12 and 24 so it's a it's a reverse um it's another one there, there's a couple others yeah we, I think we've got a couple others coming up but, so. but i but i think it's interesting because it really fo fo focuses on uh, a war strategy where it is one-sided being one side and versus the other so i think that's what's interesting about it is that we start to see the 
the very much structured games of equal sides, but then also games of unequal sides that make it very similar to military tactics, which kind of explains why, like you said, why the SEA sort of, you know, when we think for knights that we want them to play at least one strategic game, chess being one of the examples, but any of these games as well would have that sort of concept. So there you go. No, that's yeah. Well spoken. I like that. So all right. Well, Arlen, it has been a pleasure this evening. I'm looking so forward to Saturday. And all of you watching, please join us for that. Uh, like I said, like and like in the page, and I'll make sure I share that out. Um, other than that, a couple things coming up. Uh, so I've uh, we have a new show launching, uh, What Makes a Night, that you'll see on the 13th. Uh, Duke Sean Martimesia will, will be talking about uh, the other things of knighthood. Uh, of course, Coffee with Cal every other Sunday. And then our next What You Play Wednesday is going to be, uh, I'll be hanging out with Lord Nikon, who's a great friend of mine from South Downs. Uh, he also has a YouTube show called Slightly Nightly, which he talks about some of the nightly virtues. Um, we're going to be playing um, Five Lines, which is another deceptively simple game that that frustrates me, um, which seems to be a common thing for me. So, uh, but it has a, so it is a game that is hard, but also has dice, which makes it even more difficult because then you have the random number generation, which makes it even more difficult. Um, so yeah, so join us for that, uh, or at the end of the month, if you're looking for more dice action, I'll be playing Liar's Dice with my friends from the West in the uh, Corner Tavern. So that'll be a, a terribly fun night. And if I'm if I can get some of the other, I might do a giveaway that night, like we did for the last one. So tune in and win some stuff. Uh, last thing, a bit of a housekeeping. Please like, follow, share, and subscribe. Uh, so like and like on Facebook and follow on Facebook, and then like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, hit every one of the videos, like all the videos, go through and watch them. Um, the view counts help, and we appreciate it, and it makes us look better on YouTube. It makes me feel like I'm actually doing something useful and you know, not talking into the void. So I appreciate you watching, and thank you for that. And if you want to help support both Calvar's Corner and four or five other channels, because um, I, I so Calvar's Corner is also Calvar's Corner Productions, and I help other channels support, do their things, uh, court other live shows, things like that. Um, you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com backslash Calvar's Corner. Uh, lots of fun stuff on there, including a quarterly board game uh, subscription. So you actually do get some some cool stuff by being a subscriber. So look us up and help me out. All right, uh, guys, it has been a pleasure. Arwen, thank you again. And thank you. this has been Cal and Arwen in Calvar's Corner. Not everybody. Bye.